So, hello everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us for another webinar. Um, I'm really, I'm really delighted to be able to do a German wines one. I'm half German. My mum's German. She's on the, she's on the webinar. Um, don't worry, mum. We can't see you. So, anyone. Um, Anyone who's not been on one of these before, uh, you can see us and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. Um, there is a little uh, area where you can click chat. Um, there's a chat box. We've already had Dan, Amelia and Ben say hi. So please put any comments in there as we go through. We've also got a Q&A box. Um, sometimes the chat box goes really quickly, so we don't, uh, we don't get to... Um, read them fast enough um like last week it went a bit crazy um so if, if there's a specific question that you want answered then put it in the q a and i'll make sure that that's that's done before the end of the session so i'm delighted to have a quite a variety of people on the panel amelia thanks for joining us again amelia from the wine show she's also doing a wine course called uh, with learning with experts so if you're interested in doing some more wine courses, uh, please do check that out. Uh, we've got Ben uh, from Novel Wines, who's been on a couple of our um, webinars before. Um, he has been shipping out the beautiful set of wines to everybody um, who's, who's been buying the tasting pack. Uh, so that's who you've been dealing with, and we'll talk more to Ben later. Uh, we've got Anne, who is a master of wine, so we're honoured to have her in our presence. Um, Anne has, uh, I don't know if you recently wrote it, but I recently bought it. Oh no, I've got my thing on. Uh, I'll show it to you later. Um, a Wines of Germany book. And it's kind of, I mean, she can talk to us a little bit later about, um, you know, why, why we need a Wines of Germany book. Um, it's quite a, quite a vast region, but I think in the UK we don't really know much about German wines and there's a lot of prejudices which you know I think is something that we're going to address today and then we uh, we have Jan who I met what was it six years ago something like that when I went to the Mosul um, I did a tweet and said hey where shall I go and Jan replied saying hey come visit us so I did <laughs> and it was it was absolutely delightful we had a wonderful time he showed us such a range of wines and when when we come to this section of the of the webinar I'll show you some of the I mean I've got We've got a selection of his wines with me and I'll show you some of those because he's got quite a wide ranging selection um, because he works in Stafelterhof, which is one of the oldest wineries in the world, um, started in 862, so really old. Um, but it's not just traditional, he's doing new stuff too, so we'll come to that later. Um, the wines that we'll be tasting, um, if you have them with you, are the Grauburgunder, the Sauvignon Blanc Fumé, and the Pinot Noir Reserve. They are pretty special wines. We didn't go for the kind of lower level wines that Tita does. We've gone for the finer wines. Um, you know, it's our last two webinars. We wanted to do something special, so hopefully you enjoy them. I got an email from someone today who said, thank you very much for doing the webinars. I mean, I've had several of those, but um, one in particular was saying that she always buys the pack of three. She opens one on the night, one um, like for a later day, and then keeps um, a third one as a gift to give someone else. So, you know, I think these ones are a particular, particular candidate for that. Lovely wine gifts if you have wine friends. Louise is saying your webinars are brilliant. So, and the wines are so good. Yeah, Louisa, Louisa messaged me saying she'd already tried the Grau Burgunda sneaky peek and absolutely loved it. So, uh, yeah, you're in for a treat if you haven't opened it already. Please do. Um, okay, I think that's a little. I think that's everything covered in the intro. Um, so, just to kick us off with that, um, Ben and Anne, um, I would like you to both kind of give us your tasting notes maybe ben give us the textbook tasting notes and then Anne, what you're actually getting live i think that would be lovely okay. yeah sure uh so i'll start with why we bought the gore Burgunder one so uh pinot gris um or pinot grigio um but we wanted something uh, approachable uh, price wise for oliver zeta's range um but it was still really interesting and something a bit different 
So this is quite a full-bodied, um, big, smooth uh, gorbaganda with lots of nice yellow fruits. Um, and it's got a lot of difference from the quite oily styles um, of well-made full-bodied uh, Pinot Grigio uh, in Italy. So it offers something a little bit different on that level as well. Um, and also it has a nice saline texture, so it's got minerality on the finish as well, which is a really nice um, thing to get in a Pinot Gris or a Corpaganda, um, because sometimes it can be a little bit overbearing, and I think this one's got loads of zippiness, um, but still really, really satisfying um, in each sip. Also, I know Zut is quite keen that his wines pair with food, and I think this is quite a versatile food wine. And a great cheese wine, actually. I'm a big fan of white wine and cheese. And I think something mm. like this with a platter of cheddars and, and a bit of quince jelly is actually quite an indulgent way to spend an evening. So, yeah, this is, a for me, a really good introduction to the kind of wines Sita is making. Um, and at £15, a good price point for giving him a go as well. Um, so that's kind of my memory of that wine. I'm trying to only open one wine at a time on these webinars now, so I've got the Pinot Noir over there, but I don't, I don't want to drink too much. But that, that's what I remember of the Grau Bagenda. Yeah. So Anne, is he, is he on the right lines? Um, totally, and uh, what I love about it is that there's almost a honeyed tone about it, and real proper fruit, so you have body without having fat, and I like that combination. And um, when I was with Oliver, he said to me, what his aim in winemaking is, is like, never fat, never kitsch. And I think as we taste these wines, you, you get this. And so, of course, Grauburgunder is Pinot Grigio, Pinot Gris. And it's part of my job to um, taste um, Alsace wines for an American magazine. And so I get to uh, just in this past week, I tasted, um, or last week actually, I tasted 173 Alsace Grand Cruz. And a lot of them were Pinot Gris. And it is really astonishing how rich and rounded and sometimes residually sweet and spicy these Alsatian Pinot Gris wines are. And the best ones of them are monuments and you can keep them for like 40 years. And the counterpoint to this is some very, very easy drinking, almost anonymous, nondescript, high volume Italian Pinot Grigio, which, um, you know, not all Italian Pinot Grigio is like that, but certainly the vast, the vast amount of it sold. And the reason for, for the fact that it is so popular is that it doesn't offend anyone because it doesn't taste of very much okay so people can just drink white wine and you know but you know long live blandness and I <laughs> life's too short <laughs> and I think you all know what I mean um and so I like I like the idea of German Grauburgunder like this sitting very much in between the light Italian easy styles and the sort of super complex Alsa styles, notwithstanding the fact that there are splendid um, high quality Pinot Grigios and Pinot Gris and Grauburgunder in um, Alto Adice and in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. So this is a very international grape variety, but I like the German take because it's got more body, more fruit, but also more crunch and more personality. And I'm sure, Jan, you will agree with me on this. Um, many people think that all the Germans love Riesling and all the Germans drink Riesling. No, there are so many sissies in Germany as well <laughs> who don't like acid. And so Grauburgunder is incredibly successful at home in Germany too. People love drinking it but here they get a real mouthful of fruit. And I was going to say, um, I love Grauburgunder from Austria mm -hmm. as well. And I'm, I think Austria in some ways is acts as a hindrance, a bit like everyone just thinks of Germany for Riesling. Most people just think of Austria for Gruner. And me, like spending every year there, I, you know, I love all the different Morillons, Sauvignon Blancs, mm -hmm. Alba Bundes. 
would um would you say that actually Germany can is kind of in the same bracket in terms of similar kind of varieties and how it's actually to its detriment that it can sometimes be just seen as a kind of one trick pony? Well, I think people have a lot of come come to Germany with a lot of baggage. The older generation does, but hey, it's 2020. Get with the program, I say. You know and um, to be really, I'm in a catty mood today, as I'm saying it. Um, Bring it up. I'm saying it, look, the, the old guard, they are dying anyway. So, hey, here's to the future. <laughs> and um, Germany is a fantastically dynamic wine country. What I think the difficulty is, is that it, that it actually says Grauburgunder, because it's weird. Mm -hmm. And of course, to us, of course, it's interchangeable with Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, but not to everyone. So... Um, but I think with Ben and um, the people who actually bring it into the UK, you are in good hands. So this can be hands off to you. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I totally, totally agree. I think the, you know, the the name can be off putting. Um, you know, the the Burgunder for anyone watching is is like the Pinot. So you've got um, Spät Burgunder, which is late hot, late Flourish. Late Pinot, just because there's also early Pinot. And yeah. also your Frühburgunder, Spätburgunder. Burgunder in German just means Pinot. Yeah. And, and so then you have the uh, Grauburgunder and the Weissburgunder as well. So, you know, just, you know, if you, if you see that, don't be scared by it. It's, it's the same grape as the other ones that you know. So, yeah. It's, um, although I think on the, on the Pinot Noir label, it says Pinot Noir. Yeah. Mm. But I think that's intentionally so, because he he wants to make that in a more international style. Whereas this, I think, is an incredibly representative German Grauburgunder at this quality level, because you have acidity, you have body, and you have fruit, and nice. you've got a proper mouthful of flavour and crunch. And you can okay. age, as you said, if it was kept in the cellar in good conditions, this grape can age beautifully. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I'm living vicariously. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to um, tell us a little bit about, like, because there are, there are some hang-ups with people and German wine. Like, there's, there's, we don't see much of it here, which I'm guessing is because Germans drink most of it. Um, but there's not really much of a market here, so why would they export it anyway? I mean, it's growing, and people in the wine industry obviously, you know, always say, "Oh, this is going to be the year for Riesling," and it never is. Um, you know, is, do you kind of take it upon yourself to try and make that connection and communicate to people? Um, I am a communicator. That's my job. I also teach. But I am a communicator and teachers are communicators and I'm a writer and um, but I am not a missionary and um, I think people who love wine, who, people who love wine and who have an open mind will make their decision based upon what's in the glass and um, it's, it doesn't fall to me to convince the world of German wines because the opposite of this is like, um, I'm not a beer drinker. I'm this German woman who doesn't really drink beer. And um, you could do all sorts of things and try and convince me to drink beer. You know, will I ever read the sports pages of a paper? No, because it just doesn't interest me. So I just think, okay, for people who are interested, the information is there, the communication is there. And I'm very, very happy to communicate and share what I know and, and share especially background. So, because I, I also think teaching is about giving context, giving historic context, giving a world context. Like I just did, placing this German Grauburgunder somehow in its world context, because in the UK and in the US, we move in a very international market. Um, but I think, okay, I don't have to do missionary work because I think missionary work in itself is patronizing because you think you know better than somebody else what they should be drinking and look i my life is too short for that and i also think it's insulting so if somebody's interested the information is there you can read it up you can you know 
um, and also the wine is there you can and people do buy it and what I find really really interesting is that within the past um, over the past decade German wine has made strides here in the UK it's still a small part of the market and um, it's also the great thing about this is, and we, we will see this particularly when we come to the Sauvignon Blanc Fumé and to the Pinot Noir, that means it's great value. And what I find is a scandal is that people like Jan work so hard on such steep slopes and get so little money for their absolutely unique um, artisanal wine so germany is great value for the fact that it isn't hyped and that's this is one thing consumers need to be aware of because you get bang for your buck um but to get back to your question i'm happy to communicate and speak to anyone but i'm not a missionary for for those reasons because i don't want to patronize anyone i think that's absolutely lovely because a lot of people in the wine world do do that it's like we have to tell people to do this and we have to tell people to do that we must educate everybody and i'm, I'm <laughs> no no and it's kind of it's also like oh if people were only more educated they'd be reading this and whatever but you know there's always been i don't know far more people buy easy listening pop records than buy bach concertos but hey you know, like, I, I actually don't think that's a huge problem. And the funny thing is also, I've also made peace with the fact that Riesling will never be big. Um, I think that's because Riesling has got a lot of personality and a lot of acid. Acid is the operative term. And I have many, many, many dear darling friends who come here. I'm at my dining table, who come and sit at my table and they will not drink Riesling. But, you know, like, who am I to tell them that they should? We are all adults. I know what I like. You can't make me things, you know, like, as I said, okay, please don't bloody make me drink beer. You know, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. So let's not waste our time. So um, that's, that's where I'm coming from. You're in a similar um, situation, aren't you, Amelia, with your the way that you communicate it's about yeah, no, you, yes, I used to say accessible and now i'm like actually that's a patronizing term to make wine accessible and now i'm like trying to make wine relatable and empower mm -hmm. people so it's not so much educating it's giving people confidence that if they want to go there they can or at least they have the confidence but like actually you know what this isn't for me but whatever direction they're going they're not going from a position of fear or you know that for me is kind of where i'm coming mm -hmm. from um, whether I tr whether it's the kind of media stuff I do or whether it's linking wine to the arts or travel or culture it's trying to make it relatable and I actually deliberately change from my website accessible because like who am I to think that this is accessible what's my accessibility that's or that it's not accessible well it's not accessible exactly yeah. so I was like okay no that's actually a redundant word now and um, that's actually not what I stand for and, and I think that's good particularly if you are a communicator and times are changing and even with stuff that's been going on in America at the moment with Black Lives Matter and you know really list you know how you put yourself out there how do you communicate how do you talk about things and how do you talk how do you properly really connect really mm -hmm. with people educate is really connecting I must say I'm, I'm rethinking a lot of things during this COVID time and being yeah. based in America yeah and I I think it's very it's a very interesting thing to say because um you know accessibility if somebody signs up for a WSET class or they want to pass a WSET exam or a sommelier exam and they want to know more they can sign up to a class they can read a book they can you know and they can come and ask me questions and I will do my level best to explain but do I have to go out to somebody who doesn't give a toss and try and convince them I I don't work like that you know and I don't think I should we should be doing Jehovah's Witnesses. You know? <laughs> it's like okay, um, so we talked a little bit oh, about um, we talked a little bit about Riesling, and Riesling is kind of the darling of the wine world. And I've got one here, which is one of Jan's, um, and it's it's such high acidity that 
I, there's there's this theory that the more wine tasting you do, the more you seek higher acidity. So I yeah. think that's partly why people in the wine trade love it so much because it does have that high acidity. But one thing that I think it's excellent and um, for is the sparkling wine. So we've got again from from Jan uh, the sect. And the the question I wanted to ask you, Anne, about sect is how do we find the good ones because how do we find good sect yeah uh because <laughs> because you know there's there's so like even in germany there's so much like poor sect that finding the good ones is hard and then in the uk how do we find the good ones okay first of all um i am so happy that the germans chose to stick to the word sect because it's four letters and everybody can pronounce it and that's rare in the german language okay and so let's make it easy i also like the pun potential of sect um yeah let's not i've done that far too often already you know it's just fun but so the word sect just means sparkling wine in german and it covers everything from your mass-produced tank fermented plonk of which the Germans drink gallons and gallons and gallons. No other nation in the entire world drinks as much sparkling wine as the Germans. So um, that includes champagne, cava, prosecco, but gallons of sect, which are not even made from German base wine. So you have refrigerated train freight of Trebbiano from Italy, of um, um, Viura, or what's it called, I uh, can't remember, um, from Spain, really sort of neutral white base wines, arrive by the refrigerated train load and are turned into Swedish fizzy plonk. And the people lap it up. You can buy a bottle of sect in Germany for, for 3.99 euros, okay? So it's like pocket money, easy peasy, you know, like easy, easy buzz, you know? However, the beautiful thing is that Germany has got a really um, great history of quality sect. And um, that history was, there are wonderful stories, but I'm conscious of time. Um, can I tell you a lovely story about the American yeah. president? And yes, yeah, please do. So this is the turn of the last century. This is 1902 and Kaiser Wilhelm, of then of the German Empire had an imperial yacht built in New York and none other than the president's daughter. So Alice Roosevelt, daughter of, of um, President Roosevelt, was supposed to christen this ship as it, as it was launched in New York Harbor. And um, so one of the big German brands um, Sönlein wrote to the German ambassador to the United States and said, oh, once um, Alice Roosevelt does this, can she please do that with our, you know, Sönlein sect and blah, blah. And Moet, um, with their White Star brand, so Moet and Chandon, also heard this. And at the time, there was real rivalry between German sparkling wine and champagne. And um, so Moet um, actually glad handed the shipbuilder and when Alice launched it, she smashed a bottle of a Moet of champagne rather than sect. And um, this was, oh my God, you know, but it was in all the papers and wonderful. And later, um, Sunlein, the sect producer, took Moet to court. And because the English royal family were um, related to the German, you know, to the German Kaiser, Moet lost its royal warrant in England as a as a, as a sort of result of this. And so you see that this was always kind of heady stuff. And I love the fact that even a hundred years ago, celebrity, you know, advertising, marketing was already part of this heady, fizzy mix. And then, you know, like the Germans screwed it up with taxes and with their own history and with their law. And it was not until the 1980s that people started making traditional method sect again. And that was, was a very, very slow beginnings. 
but now it's really come to fruition. And if you want to find a good sect, because the, the crap is not really imported over here, what you have is very, very small bits of, you need to look for it, but there is good stuff over here. And what you need to look for is traditional method or traditionelle Flaschengärung, which means traditional fermentation in bottle. Or you look for Winzer sect. You just need to make sure that it's traditional fermentation. And then you're onto something good, to sexy sect. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. I, I love it. And um, I recently did the uh, sparkling wine section of my diploma mm. and I just fell in love with the sect all over again. So, yeah, it's, it's great. Um, right. So we've we've talked about the Grabagunda, touched a little bit on Riesling and the sect. Now, one thing that um, Ben can talk us through is kind of the Oliver Cita story. Um, heading up um, with the with the Sauvignon Blanc Fumé and why he's known for Sauvignon Blanc because where he is, the region that he's in, is well known for Riesling, as a lot of Germany is, um, but he's got loads, I can't remember what the number was, but <laughs> loads of vines uh, with the Sauvignon Blanc and he makes stellar stuff. Yeah, his, um, his Sauvignon Blanc is amazing. Uh, so the, the first time I met Oliver Zita was uh, at the London Wine Fair, so it wasn't particularly romantic, but um, he was the friendliest guy in the world, uh, and I was actually looking for Riesling, so I had no intention of buying a German Sauvignon um, at the time. Um, but yeah, I was introduced by James Fleetwood, the uh, chap at the Libo who imports Zita's wines to the UK, and he introduced... Um, Oliver is the big bear of the Fouts, which I think is the best nickname in the wine trade. And uh, he was quite shy. The reason why Oliver's not here today is he's camera shy. Um, and Felix Forster, his export manager, who usually does these things, is uh, on holiday enjoying himself. So uh, you, you've got me, unfortunately. Um, so Oliver Zito, uh, basically, he said he made his first wine uh, at the age of 40. Um, and he knew straight away that the one thing he wanted to do, and it's, it's beautiful how he puts it, so I'm just going to read you what he actually said. Uh, I think it's a nice thing. Uh, yes, yeah, so he wanted to make a Sauvignon Blanc that dances the tightrope between the stars of the new and old worlds, which I thought was lovely. Um, and the two biggest inspirations for Oliver, um, are the Loire and the Rhone Valley and I think you can taste that in a lot of his wines as well. Um, so with Sauvignon I think because Oliver was starting from scratch and he's quite um, quite poignant on this he, he says the only toes he steps on are his own um, and he's very much doing his own thing. So I think when he discovered that he wanted to make this Sauvignon and that became his mission and his dream um, the fact that he didn't have to follow everyone else's rules and make German wine, he could make his own wine, his Oliver Zita wines. Um, and Sauvignon became kind of that, that flagship part of his journey. Um, and also the, the bear, uh, which is on all his labels and knows the story much better, so I'll let her, her tell it properly. But um, Oliver says the bear has been with him uh, all through his life uh, it's in his family history um, so when I imagine when he wanted to put that on the label he definitely wanted a wine uh, that showcased his kind of dreams and what he's trying to do it's a very personal thing for Oliver and I think because wine is so subjective and about uh, when you drink it who you drink it with and everything like that part of wines that have these kinds of stories and this kind of love and passion that go into them, you can almost taste it. I think the fact that the Sauvignon is probably his best wine. I mean, I prefer his Pinot Noir because I'm a Pinot Noir fan, but objectively, I think the Sauvignon is probably his best wine. Um, and you can taste that passion and that love for, for the grape. Um, and also for the fact that he's doing his own thing. So, I really hope everyone who's got the Sauvignon at home really enjoys it because it's a very, very special wine and a very special wine on our list as well. I mean, um, 
if, if anyone wants a fantastic German wine, we almost always point them in Zeta Sauvignon's way as a as a excellent example. And I think it's undervalued as well. If you tried getting something on that level um, from France or even the New World, you'd be paying quite a bit more money than you're paying for Zeta's wine. So. Um, yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. If you if you got this from you know New Zealand or France, this this quality of wine, it would be a hell of a lot more expensive. Yeah. But like Anne said before, German wines are you know you get bang for your buck. And do you want to expand a little on the on the tasting notes? I um, when when we came online, which was about twenty minutes before we started. I had all, I had put all my three wines in the fridge, also because I don't like Pinot Noir, that is too warm, and I had already taken it out of the fridge, but I'd only just opened the two bottles and taken them out of the fridge as the white wine of the Grau Burgunder and the um, Sauvignon Blanc Fumé. And uh, just as I unscrewed the Sauvignon Blanc, that tropical note of fruit was already in the room. And... <laughs> Um, the nice thing is that, you know, I when I started out with wine, um, that was the time when you had these really, really um, overblown methoxypyrocene, you know, like this grass and tomato leaf smell and green pepper smell souvenirs from the new world and they were all the rage and if somebody was standing like two meters over there i could smell what they were drinking and it just me off so i never really learned to love souvenir blanc and i avoided it um i loved um the souvenir semillon blends of pesat Lyonion and um then because i started reviewing austrian wines i um i got an appreciation for Styrian Sauvignon Blanc and that mm. really how to love that variety. And this is interesting because um, this is like when you're sort of, I didn't come to this with an open mind. I came to this with like, oh, Sauvignon. Mm. But now I have, it's really got under my skin. <laughs> and then I hadn't tasted this for a while and I'm, and you know, with, with my experience of Styrian Sauvignon Blanc and of white Bordeaux, and then I have this, and I think, oh my God, because we've got a mouthful of acid and we've got all that tropical fruit. We've got none of the green stuff and we've got this emollience and creaminess of oak. And it just blows my mind. I sit here and I drink it. I've been nicking this all evening. <laughs> So it's lovely. And um, yes, and what I love about Oliver, and I think this is what helps him because you said, Ben, how he does his own thing. Um, and this is because Oliver grew up in the Pfalz, so he is at home in the Pfalz and he's this down to earth guy. But his family, who is in wine, they had family vineyards, but they sent him to Italy and they sent him abroad and he wasn't really in love with that they just made him do it and he stuck with it and then he also went away from the Pfalz and worked as a wine importer of new world wines in Hamburg for quite a long time and um, if you know how regionally how strong regional um, personalities and but, you know, I'm this German southerner. I, I've never felt as much as a stranger in London as I feel a stranger in Berlin but so imagine this down-to-earth Pfalz bloke in Hamburg where they can be very snooty, you know. So um, he and this brought Oliver in contact with a lot of New World wine and with South African Sauvignon Blanc. And so he's basically this down-home guy who had time to see the world and had opportunity to see the world. And only then did he come back home and do his own thing. Once he was a little bit older and knew his own convictions and was free to do what he wanted to do. And I think this is what we really taste in these wines, that, that this is his own thing and this is his idea and this is what he knows he can do. And I think he sets out very, very clearly 
because he's planted several clones of Sauvignon Blanc. What goes, this is his top Sauvignon Blanc. So this is not just, he also does stuff that is sort of more entry level, but this is the bee's knees. And only his best, ripest grapes go in there. His oak is not overbearing. The oak here just gives us this gorgeous creaminess. What I, what I feel is like emollient, it's like balm going down. And talking about his uh, best stuff, Ben, do you want to talk about the um, Pinot Noir Reserve? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the Pinot Noir Reserve is, is my personal favourite from Zeta. Um, as I was saying before everyone joined us that um, I was quite sceptical about German Pinot Noir, a pure naivety, to be honest. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and ju just having not tasted enough of it, but I remember tasting Zita's Pinot Noir and it completely changing my mind. Uh, and actually, if you want to try German Pinot Noir, I'm going to have to uh, forget that I work, I set up Novel Wines for a minute and recommend the Wine Barn, which I bought some beautiful Spat Begunders from. Um, but Oliver Zita was the first uh, Pinot Noir I tried that completely changed my mind um, very, very quickly about how good it can be. Um, so he does a uh, label uh, that says Spat Begund on it, but it's for his uh, step down Pinot Noir. Um, his Pinot Noir Reserve, which is what you've got at home, spends a little bit longer in oak. Um, it's a little bit weightier, but it still has this beautiful, silky smooth minerality, which I think is the thing that really drew it to me because it's very big and voluptuous and loads and loads of fruit, packs of fruit, but it still feels kind of weightless when you mm -hmm. swallow it. So it's, it has a lift, which I really like about this and makes it very, very drinkable. Um, there is a little bit of the um, tangy acidity, which is nice, but it's very well rounded out. For me, it's like drinking, everyone comes into my shop and asks for a silky smooth red wine. <laughs> um, and I, I always push them on all sorts of wines that we've got that are nicely softened by oak. But if they really want silky smooth as kind of a literal tasting note, I think Zeta's Pinot Noir Reserve is is that uh, in a bottle. Silky smooth, loads of berry fruit, loads of plush, very, very ripe fruit. Um, and just, for me, beautifully made. Really, really pristine winemaking. Um, that has now ended up emptying my wallet numerous times for other German Pinot Noirs to try and find stuff similar. Um, but that's the best thing about the wine trade. You find the things that you never thought you liked um, and then it puts you on this journey that feels endless to discover all this other stuff. So when you come across people like Zito, they make the wine world interesting. So I'm a bit gushy about this Pinot Noir, but I think it's really, really good. Um, and that's not because I'm halfway through the bottle either. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think the wines that we've chosen tonight are, you know, really quite special ones. Like you said, they're all, they're all the top level ones. The Grand Burgund, I don't think he has a higher level one, but it's a great one to include in the mix. Amelia, were you going to say something? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Sauvignon Blanc, um, actually, I think was Jancis' wine of the week last week. So that's also high praise and like with both of those great varieties I mean I've been putting Schmidt Burgunda in uh, my kind of corporate blind tastings for years and I love it because they always think it's burgundy and they're like oh I don't know it doesn't quite have the funky earthiness but it does have the sweet berry and, the, and that texture and that per you know and and for me like if I'm tr trying to you know try and get people who love that like the texture thing but also that lifted spice that spicy element too, which mm -hmm. you tend to get with Spreepelgunders from the Baden and Pfalz area. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, um, and I mean, I love Oregon Pinot as well. Like I'm a big fan of Oregon Pinot um, and Mornington Peninsula Pinot, but I, um, and I kind of think this kind of sits kind of halfway through that. It's not quite as big as the Oregon, but it does have that lifted resinous spice and that more fruit, for, like slightly more fruit forward as opposed to some burgundies which are like too funky and earthy and I just think this is a real crap music for some people who are a bit scared of burgundy because it might be too funky or earthy for people who think oh burgundy it's a bit wimpy you know this is a great I think I think this really occupies um a wonderful space 
And um, I think it's really interesting what you say, because this is how I feel. Um, yes, of course, I know a lot about German Pinot Noir. I have a lot of it in my cellar just because I'm exposed to it. But I love New Zealand Pinot Noir. I love Burgundy. I love Oregon. I love Mornington Peninsula. I love Tassie. I love the Pinot, the red still Pinot Noirs we now have in England, which are like, wow, whoever thought that. So I basically love Pinot Noir. And um, I think what German Pinot Noir gives to the world is kind of further facets of this fascination. So if you love Pinot, there is so much to find. So like, like you know, like, and we don't have to say Germany is Riesling, Riesling is Germany. To a degree it is, to a large degree it is, but there is more. You know, you need, don't need to get hang up on one thing because there is stuff like this. And it's great value. <laughs> This um, made in California, or this oh, yeah. in California. Burgundy, in Oregon, in Oregon. Yeah, it'd be crazy. It'd be crazy. I've been really shocked at how, even living here now, how mm. expensive Oregon Pinot and California Pinot is. And it, yeah. it needs to be a hundred dollars and really not be that memorable. Sadly, um, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Yeah. One thing I love about um, Spätburgunder is, is when I go to Germany, if you know, if you're ordering a glass of wine, you can order a Spätburgunder and it's always good. Like it's not like, um, I'm not the biggest fan of Pinot Noir, shock horror. Um, but, <laughs> and, and I, find, I find the French ones too earthy, too dirty essentially. So I don't, I'm not, I'm, you know, it's not to my taste. Um, obviously it is to a lot of people's. Um, but the Spätburgunders that you just get in a general restaurant in Germany will be fresh and easy drinking and light in style. And it's, you know, it's a really, really nice drink. So, yeah. Um, so talking about Zita being a man who does his own thing, I want to introduce Jan, who is also a man who does his own thing. So taking over um, Stefelterhof, which we said is one of the oldest uh, wineries in the world, which is incredible and you know he balances up sticking with tradition you know you've got your traditional set you've got your traditional labels changing that slightly to his 862 labels so um like this one here which are easy to spot and then he's also got um his natural wines where we have here little bastard crazy label and um portuguese another crazy label <laughs> um, yeah, and, a, and a lot of other wines as well so you've got such a range of wines and then he's got this crazy little cocktail which I love um, it's Riesling, um, Mate tea and uh, I wonder, what's that, uh, elderflower um, so it's just a little wine cocktail that we always have in our we like to have in our fridge and you just crack it open 5% you know nice little spritz so yeah to have all of that range i mean yeah and how do you do it well i think as a mosa producer you're used to having a, a huge range of wines because you have so many different parcels and of course you want to make every uh, single vineyard wine different <laughs> so when i took over um the the uh winemaking from my father in 2005 uh, and uh, that was after finishing a degree in marketing and economics. Uh, of course, I thought you have to make the portfolio a little bit smaller and uh, and make the wines uh, more like brands. So for the entry level wines, we got rid of all the uh, lagen and that stuff. It was just um, like names like Magnus, which is now the name of the wolf. We have a wolf, like uh, Oliver has a wolf, a bear. Um, we have a wolf because uh, there's a wolf in the original crest of the monastery that used to own the winery for over 900 years. Uh, and that is our little mascot animal. Uh, so you find it on our natural crazy labels. The, the wolf is everywhere and also on, uh, on the, uh, the classic wines. Um, so, um, so I'm used to making a lot of different wines. Uh, so first the, the, the strategy was to make less. <laughs> and then uh, I started to get interested in natural wine because when we um, changed the whole winery to organic farming in 2011, 2012, 
I also stopped using any additions for my classic wines. So all my classic wines are also uh, minimal interventions, so except for the filtering and the, the, the sulfites that we add uh, prior to bottling. Um, and then I started tasting some natural wines and I uh, said, oh, well, there's not a real big step for me to go to also try making some natural wines. Uh, and natural wines for, for us, it means zero, zero. So it means absolutely nothing added, not even a little bit of sulfites uh, and uh, no filtration. So they usually also have quite a bit of uh, live yeast in the bottle as well that keeps them fresh and uh, stable. Um, so, and... Uh, 2018 vintage came along <laughs> with a lot of fruit. Uh, I had bought some small bins to experiment for that vintage, but then we started making big bins, like talking fooders, like thousand liter trials or even 2000 liter trials. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I had already nine different natural wines. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> and, uh, and the people seem to like them, so that the demand is growing still. Um, so we had almost 30,000 bottles from within four years from uh, one fooder to uh, uh, more than 20 fooder of natural wine. Wow. And, um, and, uh, for me, uh, that was like a blessing because that is where I can actually uh, play around with everything. I can play around with everything I learned about winemaking in the past. But I also can go crazy on the labels, on the way how I communicate. Um, and I can put my personality really in the labels as well. My labels are, they always show my political views, but also the music that I love is hiding in them. So it's how I can actually make a product that is um, representing who I am as a person as well. You also do, talking about music, you do um, festivals at your winery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we do. Yeah, not this year so far, uh, but uh, we do about 25 uh, live music events uh, during the year. We do a little bit of theater, cabaret, um, and uh, yeah, normally in the summer, every Thursday night is a live music uh, event in the courtyard. Um, but uh, yeah, we will see maybe in August we can restart with the, those kind of events. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've, you've also got, I mean, when I met you six years ago, um, you talked us through kind of a project you're working on then, and I don't know if you're still doing it, where you were working, like almost saving the local vineyards, because the, the slopes are like this steep, and they're slate, so walking on, like no machinery, walking on them, you lose your footing, and, you know, it just became hard for the old generation to... Kind of take care of them and you you had a project where you were helping save those vineyards essentially yeah we have a group of um 10 or well, it's now you know, even more now we're in 13 wineries i think that are focusing on working in those steep, steep slopes in, in the mosul and that we are uh, saving uh, those vineyards from getting abandoned so we're taking over vineyards that the former owners can't or don't want to uh, work in anymore so I think our, um, our initiative was started in 2006 and in those 14 years so far we have almost um, rescued or uh, recultivated 30 hectares of wow. uh, the event between all the wineries that are uh, taking part in this project. And now um, uh, our wineries become like <laughs> international uh, community um, and hub for crazy ideas. Like I have an employee, a new employee, Jan, he started the first um, um, Solavi, which is um, in English it's called um, um, Sol Sol Solidary Agriculture. So he has a vineyard and people pay a certain amount of money every month for him to grow the wine there for them, but they can also come and help so it, it give, uh, things like this exist a lot in normal agriculture, but he was the first to do it in, with a vineyard in the Mosul. Uh, so that brings a lot of interesting people to us every three or four weeks, people coming to, to do something in the vineyards and they bring us new, um, new, new ideas. And also we have a very international team. We have a Peruvian winemaker, we have a South African uh, vineyard manager. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, during harvest, we easily have 
sometimes 10 nationalities working together, picking grapes. So um, it's, a, it's a place where you, it's just natural that you get a lot of crazy ideas what you can do with grapes, with labels and that kind of stuff. <laughs> you encourage that too. You encourage, to get, you encourage other people to try something new, try something different, explore ideas. Sorry, I just, just didn't get the beginning of your question. Um, so you, you encourage other people uh, in, your, in your winery to explore their ideas and new Yeah, ideas absolutely. Together. Yeah. So um, I think that's the, the best employees are the ones that are uh, um, highly motivated. And that, that is also when they can, because I have a good setup and then I'm happy if people want to use that also to their own things on the side because then they're also be more motivated and working uh, for me. So for example, the South African with the cultures, he has a project called Nomad Wines, where he's with a, they're also in London and they're making also wine in South Africa still. So he always will go during the season for, for harvesting, we go to South Africa for five, six weeks to make his wine and then he's gonna come back to, to my place. And they will be selling those wines uh, all over Europe, I think in the future. And he will probably also, start making a little bit of Riesling in Mosul to sell under that brand. And have you found different markets between the US and the UK? Because I don't know, like with your really fun labels, I would, would of course appeal to, to the US and then they wouldn't need to know the certain like grapes or whatever. I also think off dry stuff works very well in the US. The, definitely the Riesling, which I enjoyed from Washington State last night, this is the style for Riesling they don't mind things being slightly off dry. They don't have that fear, which I think the UK does when they see a bottle like this. Um, how have you, like in your experience, selling wine, marketing wine to make those different uh, yeah, markets, how has it differed? And has some things surprised you? Well, it's uh, for me, it's a bit difficult uh, because I'm selling classic wines and I'm selling natural wines and they're uh, different, uh, they're, they're usually, Quite often, it's different importers. Uh, in the UK, I have uh, a really great guy, uh, Nick, who imports both uh, ranges, the classic and uh, the natural. And he also imports um, um, dry as well as uh, the, the classical sweet wines, as Spätlese or Auslese, that he gets into restaurants uh, on the, uh, the menu to pair it with like desserts or cheese, bladders or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, even old aged uh, sweet wines work well for, for that when you have uh, an importer who does a lot of work with gastronomy. Um, mm -hmm. In the States, um, well, it's also... One range you wanted to sell than the other? It's, uh, it's definitely more dry wines in all markets, I, I would say. But um, um, in the States, I have, have one that does also quite a bit of fine herb, the off dry uh, style there. And the labels, the labels is good everywhere because it's labels that are easy to remember. And uh, so they, the, the wine, someone just said me, told me I to use my first wine. Oh, this wine is going to sell. I, don't, I haven't even tried it yet, but the label, <laughs> label is so good. <laughs> so <laughs> even if it is shit, it will probably sell. <laughs> and. Uh, so, so I, I'm really, really lucky and fortunate to have a good friend who is uh, such a great uh, illustrator who is uh, doing all these labels for me. I tell him a little bit how I think uh, I would like the label to be and he usually nails it with the first trial. So he's, he's amazing. Um, <laughs> and, and that definitely uh, helps uh, with sales. In, in the US even I managed uh, with my political label to that uh, North Carolina was not allowed to sell the last two cases of that wine. Badge <laughs> of honor. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's so great. So <laughs> Japan was a good market for you. Why do you think that is? Which one? Japan. Did you say Japan mm -hmm. was a good uh, market? Yeah, Japan. Um, that's. Um, yeah, I have two importers in Japan. So one is a very classic um, importer who's been there for a hundred years or so. And I think they found us also because of our long history. So they were looking for a partner in Germany, uh, maybe with long history, of course, with good quality wines as well. 
and uh, and um, I'm just lucky that they were one of the big players there. They uh, won best uh, wine shops a few times in the last ten years. Uh, they have a good, I think, even a good, very good online shop system. Uh, so they're moving volume mainly of the cheaper uh, entry level wines, but also some of the premium wines in the classic range. And then uh, last. It's just in December, I shipped the first uh, two pallets of natural wine also to uh, to Japan. And I think that is uh, taking on really well. They already made uh, reservations for, for this year. Uh, and because I think natural wine is a, getting a bigger and bigger thing in Japan as well, because it matches so well with their food, uh, because some of the flavor profiles are similar to sake wines a little bit. Uh, so I think uh, there's huge uh, potential for, for the natural wines uh, in Japan as well. Just to pick up on what you said, um, so I think I think Nick is in the is in the audience today. So hello. Um, yeah. So if if you're interested in finding out more about Jan's wines in the UK, they're at Modal Wines. Um, so check that out. And um, we've got uh, a comment from Lynn. Sounds like an eclectic and very cool operation. And when when we when we um, kind of developed this, so initially this was just going to be a seated tasting, but we wanted to develop it a bit more into, um, you know, more than that. And you know, we thought, well, with with Anne's experience, you know, and, and, and in her book she talks about the the new world of German wine you know, immediately Yang spr sprang to mind as well with with this eclectic and cool operation is, you know, this is this is what I understand to be the new world of German wine. Is that mm -hmm. we're coming from them? Well, I think there's a lot of stuff uh, happening um, in, in Germany uh, for a while now. Uh, and especially in, in Mosul, there's a lot of um, outsiders coming, coming in because the vineyards are dirt cheap for the, the quality uh, wine that they can produce just because they're tough to, to work in. But uh, especially in the natural wine scene, uh, um, there's people coming in. I have uh, friends, uh, Jasmine uh, Swan, she's a former sommelier. She just moved in across the road. She's gonna share the cellar with us this year for making her second vintage. And there is a, a young uh, lawyer who's doing his first vintage this year, just uh, in the next, he's, both vineyards in Kruf and Kinheim, just around uh, us as well. And Jakob Tenstedt is a very talented former chef from Berlin. He is in Traven Trabach making amazing Riesling natural wines. Um, so um, there's a lot of stuff. And it's, it's funny, there's uh, also a lot of people from outside Germany. There's uh, Philippe Lardot, he's been uh, in uh, Alf for a few years now. He's a Finnish Belgian uh, making uh, natural ish wines. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Petra Kuyanpe, she's a Finnish girl working near Kochem, making really, really amazing stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a really exciting times uh, in, in Mosul, I think, for discovering something completely different. And Anne, is that, is that across Germany as well? I think what is so interesting is that, well, the, what Jan said is, um, what you have in the Mosul is probably the last really, really great old world terroir where normal people can still try and have a go without having millions to buy a vineyard or to buy grapes. And um, which is a pity because this is kind of world class historic vineyard. And when, I mean, we need to put that into perspective. We say historic vineyard when Staffelter Hof is a is a former grange of the I don't know the the this the area of the Mosul used to be a feudal state, and um, until Napoleon annexed it in in 1794 or 92 I can't remember. Um, those were you know the there was the the monastery. And they had their granges, their sort of farmsteads, and they produced everything. And um, and so this is one of those feudal farmsteads, you know, in the, that was founded in the year 862. That's history. This is how long people have have put blood, sweat, and tears into these steep slopes. 
You know, this they have, and then if you think there is hardly any, because the Mosa Valley is so narrow, there isn't you, there aren't huge fields to grow wheat and turnips and things. So there's always been a struggle. And that struggle and that intensity and that beauty is still there. In you know, like you have to, if you love wine and if you love German wine, you have to go to the Mosel and you just have to look at these slopes. It's just, it's just incredible. And then you, you, you know, you can pick up the slate and it crumbles in your hand, and and then you taste that wine and you think, wow, I am. This is what I'm tasting. So this is historic Grand Cru land of of you know, are you, where else can you make wine like you can make in the Mosel? It's a really unique place. And the world, you know, like, yes, we've made a point of having Sauvignon Blanc that combines the new world and the old world. We have this German Burgundy lookalike, but then we have something like Mosel Riesling and even the natural wine Mosel Riesling is is only yet another face of this of this place and i think you know we're talking about marketing we're talking about education we're talking about getting people to drink wine and all that blah but if you if you love wine and if you have an open mind what you want is something that is authentic something that touches you because it's real and this is where you get it for yeah. actually for scandalously little money because these people work their asses off it's so hard i couldn't yeah. believe it when i saw it just how hard it must be to tend those vines i mean sorry yeah i wouldn't do it <laughs> and i have it's done it organic in those conditions yeah. too how do you like that must also be such a an extra yeah like Burden. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's so admirable too. But how how do you manage to keep it so strict and organic in the vineyards when you must have all kinds of yeah pesticides and things like that? And oh, well, I think it's um, it starts with your your uh, yeah how you want to to manage uh, things, and I think it's a lot more satisfying how we work uh, now. Of course, it's a, a little bit more work. Um, and uh, it's also hard work like mow mowing or like pulling out weeds and stuff like that um, but it's uh, it's definitely uh, worth it and, and uh, I wouldn't ha have the, the success also that I that I have now if uh, I wouldn't have changed to organic and and I got really tested uh, because in the first year of conversion we lost over 60 percent of our fruit it was a really bad um, downy mildew year um, so we we really um, got a reality uh, um, uh, check if we really want to do this and i said oh well it's in just tough luck so we have to, to get through this and and now actually the the vines are really strong they um, even do better sometimes than the conventional colleagues in, in especially in difficult years um and uh, so so it, it, it pays uh, back now and i think especially now after this whole Corona mess that we went through. People will be a lot more um, focused on, um, on 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 buying um, healthier and more authentic uh, products than just any bullshit. And uh, I think we, we're on the on the right train uh, now. Uh, and I think a lot, hopefully, a lot will will follow in in that realm because it's not always about. That's what we got taught in school. That you have to rationalize and produce cheaper. Uh, in order to uh, be better in the market, but it's it's uh, the opposite. You have to do something more special, uh, something that you believe in, and, and not just something that anybody else does. And then you will find your your place in, in the market if uh, if if you're really uh, passionate about what you're doing. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, I think this has been a much more relaxed session than last week, if anyone's joined last week. Um, with, yeah, it was craziness. So I've really enjoyed the pace of this one and going through, um, you know, the, the wines that we've got today. Thank you so much, uh, Ben, for uh, making sure that everybody got those in time. They're absolutely stunning wines. I hope those of you have tried them. Um, 
agree with me if not take it up with Ben <laughs> um, and yeah and thank you so much I mean it's been really wonderful having your perspective on on the German wines on these wines tonight but also wines of Germany in, in general because I think there is that kind of love-hate relationship um, that we have with with German wines so yeah it's great to great to get you on board and thanks Jan um, you know doing something completely different um, as well as doing other things that are the same in terms of the traditional stuff so having that range is such hard work and you know I, I love your work so well done um, I'll just change here um, next week for those of you who'd like to join us for our last episode um, you know we, we've had a really really wonderful time we've um, you know we've it's been amazing to be able to do this through lockdown it's been so exciting having Amelia and all of our guests that we've had you know it's been a whole range of webinars lots of different styles um like I said in a tweet earlier it's been like a box of chocolates you don't know what you're going to get um and uh, or or whether we're just as mad as a box of frogs who knows but yeah the next one is yeah it's it's very different to everything we've done so far there are kind of three ways that you can enjoy it. If you order the wines tonight, if you're not in London, you can order the wines tonight to get them in time for the webinar. If you're in London, you've still got another couple of days um, to, to get to do that. Um, and what we're doing is we're matching wines to food from Adam Handling's uh, frog restaurant, so fine dining, but that you do the finishing touches in your own home. So it's a fine dining delivery um, that, they've, that they've set up um, or collection. So with the food, if you want to order the food in time, if you're nearby and can collect it, you need to order your food by Sunday. If you want it delivered, and then it'll arrive on Thursday. If you want it delivered, you order it on Monday or by Monday but then you will get it delivered on the Friday. So you won't have the food in time for the webinar, but you can enjoy it that weekend with the wines that you wines, yeah. opened during the session. So that those are two ways of um, enjoying it. The third is just join the session. It's a food and wine pairing masterclass, um, free as usual. Uh, come along, join us, uh, learn a bit about how to match. We've got the wonderful Fiona Beckett who writes for The Guardian joining us um pretty exciting for us uh, and then also to have uh kelvin mccabe who is the sommelier at the adam handling group so we've got you know a sommelier and a food and wine writer so yeah pretty exciting next week it's our last one the wines are pretty special um, we wanted to do that for our final one and the food is immensely spectacular something something else um and they are i think the frog opening first week of august so if you want to go and see them you can um if you want to do that instead then you can you can do that instead uh, any questions uh just send me an email or um have a look at the faqs on my website like i said it's a bit more complicated so i just wanted to do a little rundown now um we do have a question oh is it gone is someone I answered it. It was about the book and I just put it in the chat box about, ah. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. there we go, didn't mention it, uh, like I promised I would. So, yeah, here's the um, book, The Wines of Germany. Um, again, on my website, uh, princessandthepino.com, there is a link if you wanted to buy it or check it out a bit further. There's a link as to um, take you to where you can do that. Um, yeah, so hope you've enjoyed the wines, hope you've enjoyed the conversation, hope you've enjoyed the chill vibe this week, and I uh, hope to see some of you next week. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you. This is awesome. It's it fun. German wine <laughs> in Washington State. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jan. Bye. Yeah, take care, guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.